Hello, welcome everybody. Happy Friday. My name is Mark Medeiros and I am the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at Peninsula Open Space Trust. And we want to welcome you to today's program on the wildflowers of the Bay Area with Andrea, Andrea Williams of the California Native Plant Society. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Native people whose territories we are joining from, uh, including the Muwekma Tribal Band, the Amamutsun um, Tribal Band, and uh, the Ramaytush Ohlone. Wherever you are, please pause to acknowledge the Native people whose territories you are joining from. Thank you. So uh, for those of you who are less familiar with posts, we have protected over 80,000 acres of land on the peninsula and in the South Bay for the benefit of all people since our founding in 1977. These lands are now part of our regional open spaces. Um, and many of these lands are also our local farms. And so we've been this successful over the past 40 years, thanks to the support of thousands of people like you. We know many of our donors are probably watching today. So we wanna say thank you to all of you uh, for making this work possible. It's been this amazing community effort that continues. We just had some very exciting news that more land um, has been protected in Coyote Valley just this week. There was a great article in the Mercury News about that success. Um, so we're coming into wildflower season now, and we know uh, that wildflowers are on the minds of many of you. Um, it's a great time to get out and see this special kind of seasonal event in our area. So we wanted to help orient all of you to um, the wildflowers of the area and get you, um, you know, some knowledge to be armed with. And to do that today, we've invited a wonderful person named Andrea Williams from the California Native Plant Society. Um, she is the Director of Biodiversity Initiatives at CNPS. And if you're not familiar with California Native Plant Society, their mission is to conserve California native plants and their natural habitats and increase understanding, appreciation, and horticultural use of native plants in California. Um, yeah, so definitely encourage you to become a member of CNPS and to get involved with your local chapter. There's many chapters throughout um, California, uh, many of them in the Bay Area and the Central Coast. And so Andrea Williams, like I said, is the Director of Biodiversity Initiatives at CNPS. She has two decades of experience in science-based public lands management, monitoring rare plants and plant communities, carrying out project compliance surveys, mapping and removing invasive plants, and responding to landscape level threats such as phytophthora, climate change, and altered disturbance regimes. She earned her BS in biology from Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, where she spent summers on field research at a coastal grassland studying species composition and demography of host plant, of the host plant of an endangered blood butterfly. And from that, she became a land manager. <clears throat> For fun, she teaches grass identification, which is quite difficult, and makes acronyms and plant lists. So with that, I'm gonna welcome Andrea to the program. Hey, Andrea, how are you? Hi, Mark, I'm well. Thanks for having me today. Great, well, we're, we're very lucky to have you, and thank you for taking the time to spread some knowledge and before we begin, I know you're a local person. Um, so I thought maybe you could just share a little bit about yourself and how you came to this work. Sure, so I was born uh, before post actually um, in the peninsula, in, uh, actually at Stanford Medical Hospital. And I grew up um, in Los Altos and Mountain View and split my time between San Francisco on uh, the weekdays and then uh, down in Mountain View every other weekend. So I grew up uh, going mostly to Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space Trust lands, um, wandering around, and I always wanted to know what everything was, and I was a, a little bit of a pest about that. 
uh, pointing at every plant and saying, what's that? So um, it's been a it's been a long time coming uh, being a botanist. I've, I've kind of been that way my whole life. And I really appreciate the opportunity to kind of share my love of plants and hopefully give people, you know, a, a little bit of a pointer down the path of wherever they are on, on plant identification and plant appreciation. Great. Well, thank you. You know, I'm on my own learning journey too, just like everybody else in the audience. And it's a something where none of us are ever going to be done with, right? So I'm looking forward to learning a little bit more myself today. Um, so I know you have a lot to cover. So I'm just going to add your slides to the program if you are ready. I am. Great. All right. I'm seeing your first slide here. So you're ready to go, Andrea. Thank okay. you. Awesome. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about wildflowers of the Bay Area and, and as I mentioned, paths of appreciation uh, of California's flora. Um, but first, I want to pause, as Mark did, and um, talk about where I'm standing right now, which is um, what's called Richmond now. But I'm speaking to you today from Chicheno Ohlone lands. Um, I encourage you to go to the native-land.ca website and explore where you are and the peoples that used to and still live there. Um, and the languages they speak. So another thing I want to acknowledge is that California was essentially founded on the eradication of diversity and the service of greed. So our, you know, California's mythologizing beginning is in the gold rush. Um, and a lot of that had to do with removing native peoples from their lands. We don't think of California as a slave state, but it really was for the native peoples. So, um, between the time that uh, California came to the United States as part of the spoils of the Mexican-American War and, you know, essentially the turn of the 1900s, the tribal population has plummeted about 85%. Um, and not only with the native peoples, but the effects of racism on distribution of public lands and siting of infrastructure are still present. Um, I think about particularly these days, the Chinese exclusion and ghettoization, the Japanese internment um, and redlining the Embarcadero Freeway, which came down um, as I was living in San Francisco uh, during Loma Prieta. And, you know, maybe due to gentrification, gentrification it hasn't been rebuilt. Uh, biodiversity is directly correlated with human health and for biodiversity and protection and restoration to be inclusive and just, it has to include environmental justice. So biodiversity, um, you know, that's a word that we toss around a lot, but it's the variety of all life um, at every scale from genes to species to whole ecosystems. Um, but specifically I'm talking to you today about wildflowers. And so I took that to mean um, the showy, herbaceous plants that you're going to see. So usually herbaceous includes grasses, but um, since this is kind of a beginner show, I took out the grasses, even though their flowers are fascinating and beautiful as well. So um, excluding the, the grasses, which is the second largest flower, uh, flowering family in California, um, the most common is the sunflowers. And then peas and carrots are the, the, next, the next ones down, so the Fabaceae or pea family and the carrot family or ABAC. Mustards are the next most common and then evening primroses, uh, broom rapes and borages and then lilies and irises. So these are kind of the biggest families. We're gonna talk about um, kind of what to look for in these different families and I'll talk about a representative from each one of those. And that's really a path on how to meet a plant to understand those relationships between species and families and genera to get you to notice the little things that maybe, you know, you're distracted by how beautiful the flower is, um, but to be able to look at and understand and at least photograph the different parts of the plants will enable you to get help either if you want to figure out what it is on your own or to have the computer help you along on that, on that path. And then we'll talk about um, how to pull it all together. So recreating responsibly and some resources for you to dig deeper. So everybody knows California poppies. Um, what we think of as the California poppy is actually hundreds of varieties uh, that are locally different and distinct. Um, so when people want to, you know, 
toss poppy seeds out along the roadsides that actually could be damaging the local population. And so I wanna take a moment to appreciate just how biodiverse California is. We do have more biodiversity than any other state in the United States. And then as I mentioned, biodiversity includes genetic richment, richness all the way up to ecosystems. The San Francisco Bay Area itself is home to over 2000 uh, native plant species. So obviously I can't talk to you about all of them today, but I do wanna give you kind of a foundation of knowledge that you can build on if you so choose. And if you don't so choose, you can just look at the pretty pictures and, and not worry about it. Um, there are over 1300 plant species in, that grow in California and that don't grow anywhere else in the world. So we are an enormous reservoir of diversity um, at pretty much every level. So where do you start learning plants? And this is where, you know, I'm, I'm just between us a little bit uh, envious of the way that birders can do it. Um, they start by learning the common birds that they see every day, the birds that come to their feeders. Um, they have a really strong mentor network where people can get out with more experienced birders and learn additional birds. We, we do have that with the California Native Plant Society on our plant hikes. Unfortunately, COVID's shut that down a little bit. Um, so I want to show you some of the largest and most common plants. Conveniently, the largest plant families are pretty well represented in the Bay Area. And some of this, I'm going to give some species numbers on the following pages, and those are limited to the herbs. So for example, the, the pea family has everything from, you know, trees all the way down to little tiny annual plants. Um, so the other thing that you do once you know your common plants fairly well is to learn the features that you need to look at to tell those common plants from other species. So things to look at, you know, how, what, how does it grow? Where does it grow? Does it grow in a wetland? Does it grow in a grassland? Does it grow in a forest? looking at the number and arrangement of petals and leaves, and you'll see a lot of examples of that coming up. And then anything that you notice, textures, smells, sap, the way the seeds look, those are probably gonna be mentioned somewhere um, because they're notable to you, they're gonna be notable to other people. And, and people are great at recognizing patterns, so don't feel intimidated by any of this. Um, you know, folks, folks, once you get a search image, you can pretty well tell if something is what you're looking at or not. So the other way to do this is to, well, not the other way, the additional way to, to boost, to bolster this is to take pictures and upload your observations. So you can upload them to CalFlora or iNaturalist. Um, there are different websites for kind of the same reason, but have different kind of functionality. Um, you wanna give a sense of scale because as you maybe will see in some of the pictures upcoming, it's hard to tell how big something is from just a photo. Is it you know three inches tall or is it three feet tall? So I move through life lazy but suspicious, and that's a little bit different from trust but verify. Um, I really like the way that uh, uh, artificial intelligence is giving me suggestions, but I'm always suspicious of those suggestions and I want to, to know them for myself. And this might go back to when I was a beginning botanist and somebody was telling me that something with a particular species then I found out later it wasn't that species. So I always wanna check identifications so that other people give me and check my own identifications against some, some different spaces. Um, sketching is another way that I got started. Um, we didn't really have the whole digital camera thing when I was growing up. Um, not that I'm all that old, but I'm old enough. Uh, sketching is an excellent alternative. It's a really great way to get you focused in on the details of a particular species or a particular plant it's also really meditative. And so if you want to spend more time in the outdoors, um, or even if you have plants in your yard that you want to sketch, you know, nature journaling, or just sketching a plant quickly, they are great ways, um, but a little less shareable. So jumping right in to the biggest family in California, and I think the biggest family in the world, um, the Asteraceae. So this is a massive family. And what we think of as flowers aren't really flowers in Asteraceae or the sunflower family or the daisy family. Um, it's, an, it's a whole inflorescence. So each of these, you know, seeds on a dandelion head, this happens to be a native uh, large flower, Agosaurus. Um, those are each from a single flower. So each of these things that looks like a petal is actually an individual flower. Same thing for this thistle. Each one of these little spiky things is its own individual flower. And that's kind of fascinating. 
about this family. So the chicory subfamily, these are what we tend to think of as dandelions. So dandelions and chicories, they have these strap shaped flowers that we often think of as petals. They're usually yellow, but sometimes they're white or bluish or purple. And these plants all have milky sap, which not a lot of species do. So I think uh, the Asteraceae, the dandelion subtribe, um, the bellflowers, the milkweeds, and maybe the uh, Convolvulaceae, the bindweed family, those are ones that have milky sap and that's pretty much it in California. Um, a lot of these are non-native and so you, you will probably see some in their yard, you'd certainly see some in my yard, but there are some lovely native examples and I really love um, this species in particular, the large flower Agoceros, you can't tell from the picture, but the, you know, they're kind of softball sized moons of seeds when they get that way. And even the flowers themselves are, are quite lovely. Um, when you think of the sunflower family, you often think of the aster subfamily. So daisies, sunflowers, cudweeds, goldenrods, tar plants, yarrows, they'll have these showy ray flowers and the tubular disc flowers. So thinking of a daisy, You've got the white petals, those are the ray flowers. You've got the yellow center, those are the disc flowers. Um, so that family is also quite diverse um, and numerous. This thistle subfamily, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to tell when something is a thistle because it's spiny in some way. So not only this beautiful um, Western thistle, sometimes has snowy thistles, sometimes Venus thistle, um, they're reddish to purple. These, these native thistles have some of the most tremendous colors in the family. Um, they can be yellow in some of the non-native star thistles and even some of our native thistles can be kind of cream colored. Um, there are some lovely native examples and there are several rare endemic thistles in the Bay Area. So they don't, um, they don't grow anywhere else in the world. There are a few other species that don't fit into these categories. This is a plant that you'll probably see later in the season um, growing in some forested areas. It's called trail plant or trail marker plant. Um, Adina Colin by color. And on the other side of that leaf, it's a little arrow. And if you turn the leaf over, it's this white arrow so you can help find your path. I put these little numbers here today to kind of remind myself that I should be going one, two, three, four, but I'm almost always going to go one, two, four, three. But the photos are in this, this order, one, two, three, four. So what's a great example of this family? It's hard to pick just one, but I did want to pick gold fields because we do think of California as the golden state and maybe it's because of the poppy, but the way that gold fields can create this just entire wash of gold on hillsides, often on serpentine or in seasonally wet areas, it's, it's just tremendous. And I think um, it, the show is happening right now. So if you go out to some of the serpentine areas, which I'll talk a little bit more about on the next slide, you'll be able to see those. Um, there are 15 kinds of gold field in the Bay Area, which is kind of wild to think about. There are seven rare types. Uh, California gold fields, which is pictured here, it has three subspecies and two of them are rare. Um, so I think there's one that grows in Contra Costa and one that grows, I think, in the South Bay. But they're, they're really tiny. Um, but... So you can see here, there's a hand for scale. One of the ways, two of the ways that you can identify them are these, the underside of the flowers actually are these things called fillaries and they're the greenish bracts. They're critical for identification of gold fields and really for a lot of this whole family. And then the leaves as well are critical. Um, something I just wanted to call out, there's uh, several moths that specialize in the Asteraceae in this family. This is the small, Hel Ooh, I spelled it wrong. Heliothetes is what it should be. Um, does specialize in, in this family. And there are, there are hawk moths that will specialize to the extent that they can see the hidden diversity in tar plants that we can't see. So the insects are really keyed in, particularly to this family. So I mentioned serpentine, it's our state rock. So here is a picture of our state rock with our state flower. If there were a California quail there, it would be a trifecta. You would have the bird, the flower, and the state rock. And if you were wearing, wearing gold, you would have the state mineral. Um, but serpentine or serpentinite, it's, it's really a fascinating rock. It's, it's pretty colorful. 
It can range from these grays to kind of a green blue sort of soapy look to a reddish purple and we'll see some of those flakes later. It's really high in heavy metals uh, such as nickel and low in nitrogen and calcium, which are two things that uh, plants really need to grow. So a lot of them have specialized adaptations to grow on these thin soils. Um, some of them can grow in multiple places. Some of them can only grow on serpentine. And because it does take a bit of adaptation, a lot of these serpentine soils are somewhat resistant to non-native plant invasion. And that results often in some tremendous spring wildflower displays. Unfortunately, we're not having the greatest of, um, of years uh, rain-wise, although it's really nice to get some March rain. Um, so the wildflower displays, it's not a super bloom, but there's still, there's still fascinating diversity to be found. Edgewood Park and Serpentine Loop Trail are both really great places to see serpentine plants. And we have a really nice band of serpentine that runs up through the Bay Area. So we're, we're very lucky. Um, somebody asked about the small greenish bracts on the underside, they're called fillories. So you can see here, let me actually zoom in, see if this works. Zoom in here. And you can see these fillories are in a graduated series and they outcurve. Um, in the thistles, the fillories are modified into spines and you can't see the fillories here on this slide. But here you can see these greenish bracts, they're fillories, P-H-Y-L-L-A-R-I-E-S and it's just a modification of the word fill, which means leaf. So heading from the Asteraceae through Serpentine to the P family, or the Fabaceae, there are really three subfamilies and they all are united um, by beans. So if you think of peas and uh, vetches and uh, acacias and screw beans, um, you will think of their fruits, and those fruits are essentially pods with little lentily type of seeds in them. I'm not really going to talk a lot about the mimosa subfamily because they're almost entirely woody plants, but they have these really different non-pea family flowers. When you think of the pea family, you think of flowers that look like this. Um, but the species that we have in the Bay Area are usually non-native acacias, but down in the southern part of the state, we have these fantastic fairy dusters and um, mesquite as well, which are both really important to their systems. The redbud subfamily is pretty much just our Western redbud here. Um, lovely pink pea looking flowers. They're not quite the same as the, the true peas, which are down here, um, but they have simple leaves, which is kind of unusual for this family. And the Western redbud is a great landscape plant. The Eastern redbud is kind of more commonly planted, but maybe that will change. Um, so there are two ways once you get down to this true pea flower type to um, figure out what subfamily you have. And it's not really directly a subfamily, but some of them have this leaflet here that ends in a tendril. And some of them have a leaflet that ends in a leaf. So if you think about sweet peas and vetches, um, even the sweet peas that you have growing in your yard, you have them ending in a tendril that sometimes is coiled around other species and helps them climb. And if you think about lupins and clovers, which are two of the more common of the leaflet division of the pea subfamily, then you know that they end in a, a leaf. So there's not a tendril, a really modified leaf that's a tendril. Milk vetches, we don't have a lot of them around here. Loco weed is another name for those. Um, and they are much more common down south, but they have kind of an inflated rattle pod seed. Lotus, we do have a lot of those. They're split into different uh, genera right now, um, but they're each in their own tribe. And lupins and clovers have palmately compound leaves and others are pinnately compound. And so if you're, if you want an, an illustration of that, this is a pinnately compound leaf ending in a leaflet, and this is a palmately compound. So if you think about, you know, your palm having that common point of attachment, and then the pinnate is, stands essentially for a feather. So you have that central rachis or stalk. But, you know, to me, the pea family, clovers, clovers are it for me. Um, lupins are too hard to tell apart. I have a little more success with clovers. 
Tomcat clover is our most common native clover. Uh, it's kind of fantastic. It's, you know, up to a foot tall, which is pretty big for a native clover. There are 54 kinds of clover in the Bay Area, um, which is kind of astonishing. And 34 of them are native and three of them are rare. So the tomcat clover here has these fused bracts below the inflorescence. So you've got the cluster of flowers up here and these bracts are fused into a wheel. And some of them, it's a little cupcake cup and some of them it's missing or really just like this little vestigial ring. And that's really important in clover identification. Another thing that's important is this calyx here, which is kind of the, the lower part of the flower. So you've got the actual corolla here and the calyx here. Um, and this one has a distinctive patterning of splits and teeth. Some of them have these long plumose lobes, really lovely. Um, and so this, you know, the flowers themselves look pretty similar in tomcat clover and um, in uh, allopurpureum, which is, I think, I forget what its common name is. Um, they look fairly similar, but the, the calyx and the, the wheel underneath are, are very different. Um, so somebody asked if oxalis was similar to clover. Um, they look similar, but their flowers are completely different. They're in totally different families. So um, clovers are in the pea family and oxalis is in its own family, the oxalidaceae. It's a pretty small family in California. A lot of butterflies and moths will use clovers as host plants and the flower nectar itself supports a ton of pollinators. So the pea family, I talked a little bit about um, things that are needed for identification. So definitely, again, photos of leaves and the underside of the flowering heads, but uh, peas in particular, um, once they start to go to fruit, that can also be important. Um, the number of flowers in an inflorescence for things like lupins and vetches are pretty important. Um, where's hairy? So what parts of the plant are hairy and in which wet, what way and then what the calyx looks like, um, the arrangement of leaflets and even um, sometimes the relative size of the inflorescence to the leaf and a lot of the vetches and then sometimes what the fruit looks like. So some of these clovers will do some pretty interesting things once they start to go to fruit. And so it's important to get, you know, uh, plants that are at different periods in their um, development when you're taking photos. Um, the APAC, boy, I gotta, I gotta keep moving because I'm getting, I'm not getting very far. I love talking about plants too much. Um, little flower umbrellas. So the APAC used to be called the umbellifery. Um, um, umbellifer, kind of like umbrella and the flowers or the inflorescence is very similar to an umbrella. You have kind of this central stalk and then rays out from that where the flowers are, or in some of these cases, in the case of the Lomatiums and the Tauchias, it's a compound umbel. So you have that central stalk and then the rays, which themselves are a central stalk for more rays, and then there's flowers. Um, but we're really pretty familiar with this family from our kitchens, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, four basic, really basic types. This isn't um, at all taxonomically correct, but um, I tend to group the Lomatians and Tauchias together because they're usually low growing. They have these compound umbels, so lots of little flowers arranged in this, you know, doubly umbrella shape, and then really strongly dissected leaves for the most part. The fruits are variously ribbed. Sometimes they are have these little thready ribs, and sometimes they're really broad wings, so they look more like a sunflower seed, um, although they're not at all related to sunflowers. And these are often important for identification. This group in particular has the strongest parsley smell, so people will often notice that um, when they're noticing these plants. The sanicles and oringos, um, not really that closely similar to each other, but they do both have leathery leaves that are toothy or lobed to dissect it, and kind of smallish flowers. So oryngium or coyote thistle um, is related to the sea holly, if you're more familiar with ornamental um, garden plants, um, kind of this really teasily looking inflorescence, but they are members of this family. They don't have the sheathing stems that are typical of, um, of the ABACE, but their seeds um, are also atypical. They're kind of spiny or pointy, but not ribbed. So if you look, let's see if I can zoom in on this again. If you can see here, um, that base of the leaf, that swollen part, that's kind of the sheathing inflorescence. 
that I'm talking about. So let's go to the small white flowered ones because they too have spiny fruits, um, American carrot and hedge parsley. They're, you know, this, you can't tell from this that these two are different sizes. So this is about three to four feet tall. This is about, you know, four to eight, maybe 12 inches if you're lucky tall. So really short, really diminutive annual. Um, hedge parsley is hardly ever seen. Um, they're small carroty, carroty natives. They do kind of smell like carrots with ferny leaves and clustered flowers that will turn into spiny fruits. There are a ton of non-natives in this group. So a uh, small and giant rock destroyer, or not rock destroyer, sock destroyer, um, also called, called hedge parsley sometimes. So this is um, Daucus pusillus, the wild, the non-native wild carrot is um, Daucus carota. So really closely related to carrots. Uh, moving on to the taller white flowered ones. So usually, you know, three or four feet tall, although the yampas can be, you know, about a foot tall, maybe two feet tall. Uh, pinnately compound leaves, except for the cow parsnip is usually more palmately compound. Um, the seeds themselves are smooth with ribs or wings, and they do have these really broadly sheathing stems. So all of these really important, the leaves in particular are very important for this family to identify. And they really do have the best leaves. So why wouldn't you wanna take pictures of them? This is purple shoe buttons or Sinicula bipinatifida. And, um, you know, I, I think it's our most fun sanicle. It's kind of the, obviously if it's, this is the plant that I picked out of the whole family. Um, this is one of my favorites. So there are 70 members of the carrot family in the Bay Area and 11 of them are sanicles and three of those are rare. So most people call uh, Sinicula bipinatifida purple, purple sanicle because we don't really have shoe buttons anymore, but I really love saying purple shoe buttons. So I'm gonna say it a lot. Um, maybe, you know, they've gone the way of sock garters, but purple shoe buttons is really fun to say. Uh, distinctively purple flowered, and it's got these twice pinnately lobed leaves, which is what bipinatifid means. Uh, very often they have this bluish cast, which I find really lovely and quite the contrast um, with those purple flowers. The carrot family is, is as I mentioned, really familiar to you. Um, carrots, celery, parsnips, parsley, coriander, fennel, and dill, they're all members of that family. So you could go into your kitchen maybe and find, you know, some coriander or fennel seeds and take a look at those seed ribs, get an idea of what those look like. You could go in and look at the celery and see, oh, those are just really modified sheathing stems. That, that's what we selected for when we selected parsley, or not parsley, celery. Um, the bracts around the flowers, the arrangement of the leaflets, the type and surface texture of the fruit, they're all really important for identification. And the, um, the anise swallowtail is becoming much more common because it does use members of the carrot family, you know, anise is a member of the carrot family, as a host plant. And it, it very often will in the wild overposit on yampa and lomatium, but it's also using fennel and parsley, you know, the escaped non-native fennel. So I see a lot of them in San Francisco and in Oakland in otherwise urbanized areas that they wouldn't usually be in. Um, and parsley, you know, in people's yards. So you'll get these sometimes in people's gardens um, or out in the wild. So some, some butterflies have become more common because of some of our non leaves. Uh, we don't have uh, shoe buttons anymore. Um, we mostly have laces and zippers and buckles. Um, we used to have little fancy shoe buttons where we'd have to button up our shoes um, like the way we used to have to button up our underwear. Although I don't think that I ever did that. I think I only said it. Um, so that is purple shoe buttons and the APAC. Moving on to the mustard family, which is another one that is probably fairly familiar from your kitchen, although you don't really may not recognize the plant, although you might recognize the weedy ones. The native ones are, uh, I don't know, I think they're fairly spectacular, but then I'm a little biased. So one of the wonderful things that I'm not going to have time to talk to you about today are some of the ways that um, that you can immediately tell, like narrow down to one of a few families. I talked a little bit about the um, 
the milky sap, well, four petals is another one. So poppies, that family has four petals. It has tons of anthers in the center and poppies are pretty, pretty recognizable. But this family, the mustard family, and the next family that I'm going to talk about both have four petals as well. And um, the way that you can tell those two families apart, among other ways, is where the petals are in relation to the fruit or the ovary. Um, so with the mustard family, the flowers are below the ovary. And with the next family, the evening primroses, they're above the ovary. And you can really see that in fruit. So toothworts and tower mustards, you know, toothwort season or milkmaid season is kind of over. It's really our first wildflower of the season, starts blooming as early as January, really gets going in February. Um, more common a little bit in some of the uh, wooded areas where there's a little bit of shade. But uh, tower mustards and toothworts uh, tend to have basal and stem leaves that are toothy or lobed, sometimes pinnately lobed. Um, at least on the upper part, few to no hairs. Sometimes they're hairy down um, at the base and white flowers. So not the colors of a lot of the other species in this family. Their seed pods are siliques, which is a fancy term. You know, all of these big families tend to have their own fancy terms for fruits or flowers, like I mentioned, fillories with the asteraceae. Um, and uh, the long thin fruit in the mustard family is called a silique. The big round ones like uh, this here is called a silical, which is kind of like a circle. So siliques are sleek and silicles are circular. Um, the tower mustards and the toothworts are great hosts for butterflies, such as our margin white and Sarah orange tips as well. Um, there's a cabbage white that almost everybody knows from their yards, which kind of those black tipped wings, they really take advantage of the weedy mustards and they're um, starting to make their way into uh, some of the wilder areas and pushing out um, some of these margined whites, as well as, you know, their native hosts are becoming a little less uh, common, which is really sad. Um, the rock cresses and wallflowers are uh, usually pretty small. Um, the rock cresses in particular tend to be under a foot. The wallflowers can be much larger, um, but they mostly have basal leaves that are toothy with these really fancy branching hairs that you don't notice at first, but you can notice if you take a look at them really closely or if you have a hand lens or some sort of magnifier. Um, cresses have purple or white flowers and wallflowers are this brilliant orange yellow to white and their seed pods are also siliques and the rock cresses in particular tend to grow in rocky areas so rock crevices or outcrops. Um, I lumped a bunch of them, a bunch of the mustards into kind of this leafy stemmed and fat, fat fruited so pepper weeds, fringe pods, watercress, yellowcress, tansy mustard. These are fairly inconspicuous um, mustard plants, except for the fringe pod, which is kind of fruiting now. They tend to be a little fancy. Um, so they all have kind of lobe to ferny leaves. They'll continue up the stem. And the pepperweed fruits tend to be heart-shaped, but the fringe pods are these lacy circles. And then um, the other ones, watercresses and yellowcresses and tansy mustards are kind of little sausage-shaped. Um, even to the point of being like little curved ones. Also a little bit like these, um, but they're very different in their flowers. And a lot of the pepperweeds are non-native, but there are native ones as well. So fancy flowered, um, fancy flowered mustards. Mostly it's not just the petals, but it's also the calyx. And we'll go into this in the next slide a little bit. Jewel flowers and some, of, some but not all of the colanthus, um, which are, have a bunch of different common names, so I'm just using the, the scientific name here, have basal and stem leaves that are usually toothy. Um, they'll have simple bristly hairs on a lot of them. And then what looks like the actual flower is mostly the color in this is an inflated colorful calyx. So jewel flowers will often have purple or white flowers and colanthus will have yellow or white. Um, really, showy species down in the southern part of the state is Colanthus inflatus, inflatus, which is a desert candle. Um, our Colanthus up here tends to be not quite so showy. Um, their seed pods as well are siliques and actually the, the direction that they point and sometimes the way that they curve is, is fairly important in identification. 
So the mustard family is really great at making new species. Um, it's, it's already known for its flexibility and form in kind of the garden environment. So cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, savoy cabbage, kohlrabi, and gailin or gailan are all from the same species. So that's one species, all of these different forms. We're not really putting that much selective pressure on our wild plants, but they're making these wild splits, particularly in the jewel flowers. Um, and even some of the recent genetic work that's been done on California mustard shows that there's a lot of hidden diversity in this group. And I put a little list of all of the jewel flowers in just the Bay Area. And these plants are super tiny. Um, they are, this is the same species, just at a different stage in its development. So this is just in bud, and this is in fruit. And this is the Mount Hamilton jewel flower. So it's a great example of, you know, here is your uh, mountain with serpentine in the Bay Area, and it's got its own particular jewel flower. Uh, Mount Burdell, Mount Tamalpais, Mount Hamilton, um, Mount Diablo, they all have their own jewel flowers. There are 140 members of the mustard family in the Bay Area. 85 of them are native, so there's a lot of non-natives. Those kind of yellow flowered mustards all over the place, most of those are non-native. 10 of the jewel flowers are rare. Um, and every major mountain, as I said, in, in the Bay Area has its own. A lot of them are serpentine specialists and the purplish or orange leaves that they have um, really do match the flaked rock of their habitat. So you can hardly tell the color between this leaf and this flake of rock. They really do blend in kind of tremendously. And then over here, you can see it in fruit, got these really strong bristles, not only on the leaves, but on the fruits. And they look like little elephant trunks. So the fact that they're up curve can be significant in, um, in identification. So moving on to kind of the other four petaled wonders in the Bay Area. Um, this is the Onagraceae or the evening primrose family. And so there are four uh, basic groups of the evening primrose families. The, the fruits are actually below the flowers here and maybe we'll see that a little better on the next page. But this is the ovary here and the, these are the petals where if you look at the last one, um, you can see, maybe you can't, but the, that little tip there is the attachment point of the flower, um, or sorry, the attachment point for the flower is down there. And so the ovary comes out of, you can zoom in here and maybe we can see yeah, the little bits of base of flower around that fruit. So sun cups, kind of different. Um, they're usually pretty low growing. There are a couple of different types of them. Um, one of, they used to be the same genus and then they got split out. So yellow flowers with this globo stigma. I don't know if you can actually see it or not. It's hard to tell a globe straight on, but it's this little round ball at the end. And that's kind of distinctive for this family. Most of the other ones have sort of a four parted splitting, um, pretty fancy stigma. So leafy annuals, to the, this one is Chiraxia oveda or sun cup. Um, it's one of our larger ones and you've probably seen it. It should be blooming right about now um, in a lot of grasslands. Clarkias, I mean, everybody hopefully here on the, on the call, the call, whatever this is, um, knows about Clarkias. They're super showy, they're annuals. California, again, is kind of the center of diversity for Clarkias. They have a ton of local variability in addition to variability among the different species. And the next plant that I'm going to show you as an example um, is going to be a Clarkia as well. So the evening primroses are another kind of recognizable plant. They're um, super hardy. The ones in the Bay Area are yellow flowered and you know three to four feet tall down in the South Bay, or not in the South Bay, in the Southern part of the state, they can be white or pink. So very common in the desert, tons of evening primroses in the desert. Um, and because Caltrans plants native plants, they've brought up some of the really far Southern California plants and planted them kind of along some of the roadsides as durable natives. Um, the evening primroses are really great at interbreeding. So it's kind of a scary thing for our local diversity. 
But uh, the Evening Primroses host white wine sphinx moths, which are huge and amazing. They sound like hummingbirds. And the Evening Primroses will very often open up at night or in the early evening, and the, the moths can come, come humming in. So I, I really do appreciate this, this whole family. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. The willow herbs also are, are super variable in size. Some of them are only a couple inches and they're serpentine specialists. And some of them, uh, like this panicled willow herb, are several feet tall. Um, they have pink to purple or red flowers. So a lot of you may be familiar with the California fuchsia. Um, that's a beautiful red flowered willow herb in the epilobiums. So they're very often um, late blooming, which is great for particularly bees, but other pollinators when a lot of the other flowers have tapered off, the evening primroses come roaring in. Um, some of them do have fluff tufted seeds and may be known as fireweeds. You can um, use them to start fires. Not that I'm encouraging anybody to start fires, but back when you needed to do that with plants, you could do it with fireweed. Um, this is elegant clarkia. It is, I think, our most elegant clarkia. So good job on the naming. Um, much easier to say than clarkia unguiculata. Um, although unguiculated is also fun to say. There are uh, 70 members of the Evening Primrose family in the Bay Area, and 30 of them are Clarkias, five of which are rare. Um, the young leaves of Elegant Clarkia are often this really nice purplish veined. Um, it's very tall, like three feet tall, distinctive pink to purple flowers, and these nice spoon-shaped petals. They can be tricky to identify. Clarkias, not elegant Clarkia in particular, but some of the other Clarkias, you may need to see plants and bud, whether or not it's drooping or upright, and then um, counting the sepals or seams in the fruit. So it, it can be a little daunting, but taking good pictures will help people help you identify them. Um, the evening primrose family has really great natives for the garden, California fuchsia, farewell to spring, red ribbons. So you're probably familiar with some of these they can be hardy to the point of weediness. So I have some uh, panicled willow herb in my yard that I didn't plant. I'm super happy to have it there. Um, and you'll see them a lot along roadsides. Broom rapes and borages, we are getting down to kind of the, the end of the line here. Um, these are two different families. So I'm gonna talk about the left side and then the right side. Uh, totally parasitic. So broom rapes, um, traditionally they were mostly entirely, well, they were entirely parasitic. So they lack chlorophyll, they rely on their host for nutrients, they're very often kind of host specific. You need to look at kind of the number of lobes and then the size of the stalk um, to the central attachment. So this is what used to be called um, well, anyway, it's called Aphalon now, and then there are also what used to be called Boschniakia, which is my name on my naturalist. Now they're called Copsiopsis. So there's been a lot of revision in this family, in addition to including what used to be all of these plants in the figwort family that can sometimes be parasitic. So paintbrushes, owls, clovers, bird beaks um, are all in, well, not all of them, but are in the Castilea and Trichysaria. Um, genera and now they're grouped in with these broom rapes because they can both be uh, somewhat or entirely parasitic. Then we have the borages. So what used to be the hydrophilaceae down here um, was the water leaf family. This fancy curled inflorescence that you can maybe see a little better if I zoom in. Still pretty clustered but it's called a scorpioid sign. So a fiddle neck essentially. Um, you can see it here in the borage. This is um, rusty popcorn flower. Um, so they were grouped together largely because of that relationship. These have mostly the floral parts are hidden in inside the petals, so you don't see the stigma, you don't see the anthers. Um, they can be white in the popcorn families, popcorn flowers and the cat's eyes yellow in the fiddle necks and blue in hound's tongue and forget-me-nots and their fruits are nutlets um, which is fun to say but really hard to use in identification. Um, the hydrophilaceae is a little easier to identify so phacelias, baby blue eyes, other nemophilas are pretty typical of this group and the flowers are usually white to blue or purple and the, the seeds themselves or the fruits themselves are capsules. 
Um, so this, the broom rape family, going back to the other family, it's, it's a bit of a trip. Um, they can be really similar to each other. And so this is a purple owl's clover and this is a dense flower owl's clover. And at the first glance, they look exactly the same. Um, and if you zoom in, you can see this really shaggy, hairy tip. And this is the stigma pointing out. So this is Castilea excerta with the excerted style. And then this is Castilea densiflora, which is no more densely flowered than the other one, but it's not as shaggy hairy. It's just kind of soft hairy throughout. And then you don't see that big round stigma pointing out. And maybe you can see the little owl's face here on the owl's clover. So, um, 67 members of the Brimrate family, over 30 Castilea, 13 of which are rare, so super diverse group. Um, they can look really similar, and the bracts, how you know how far down does the color go on the bracts? Because um, some of most of these aren't petals, most of them are actually modified leaves. And then how pouchy, like how pouchy is this versus how pointy is that? Really important in identification. Um, so this is the broom rate family, which is this side. And then we're going to talk about the borage family, which is the other side. And yes, this is the same family as, um, you know, the common borage that you might have planted in your yard. That's actually a really great way for you to see those four nutlets um, when the plant is in fruit. And think about you know, looking at nutlets that are a quarter of that size and trying to figure out what they are. So board family is nutty. Um, this is uh, Nemophila menziesii menziesii. This is Nemophila menziesii adamaria. They differ in flower color. They grow together. They flower at the same time, but they seem to remain distinct. So I haven't really figured that out. Um, this part of the family, what used to be the water leaves, much easier to identify. So last couple families, um, these are the only monocots, unfortunately, that I will be featuring today. And monocots um, just means that they have one seed leaf instead of, instead of two seed leaves. And usually these kind of strappy grassy leaves. Lilies over here, irises over here. Similar to the way you tell the mustards from the evening primroses, the attach, where the flowers attach to the ovary is important. Um, so lilies have petals below the ovary, um, and irises have petals above the ovary. And then you can also look at, for lilies, there's a really nice split between the three spots and the sixers. So what looks like here, um, you know, six petals, these are actually, you know, three of them are petals and three of them are sepals. And so there, there are modified whorls. And so in the calicordis, for the most part, but also the fetid adder's tongue, they are very distinct looking. So you have this, what looks like a three petaled flower. Um, really tremendously beautiful, dozens and dozens of calicordis in, in California and all strikingly different, beautiful coloration, different size nectaries. So lots of things to look at um, when identifying those species. Fetid adder's, adder's tongue is one of our early blooming plants. Um, it's really fritillary season right now. And this is what we think of as maybe true lilies, uh, fritillaries and lilium. Um, the whorls of the flower look similar. So they look like they have six petals. The, um, whor the Very often the leaves themselves are whorled as well. And they mostly have colorful flowers, but the fairy bells are white flowered. And the red clintonia obviously is red. Um, grass irises, so blue-eyed grass and golden-eyed guide grass tend to be, you know, about a foot tall. Um, both of the whorls of the flower look similar, so they look like they have six petals. Um, they do have these really strappy shaped uh, leaves. And then the, what we think of as true irises have these strappy shaped leaves, but the um, flower parts are really strongly modified. And most of us can recognize, you know, that's an iris of some sort. So with irises, the, um, the flower color is extremely variable, but the length from this fat part, which is the ovary, to where this, um, the petals start to flare out is called the tube. 
and it's um, it's very uh, distinctive in identification. So really good to get that um, length down. So I talked about this at the beginning. You know, learning the common plants. I've given you a, a ton of the families and their plants and how you might be able to start making a foundation for plant ID and then the features that you need to look at for telling these common plants from other plants, um, taking pictures and uploading your observations to Calflora and iNaturalist is what I'm gonna talk about for just a second because I'm almost out of time. Um, taking pictures, having something for scale, focusing on the flower, the top and the underside, showing the leaves and the arrangement um, and their attachment, and then taking a picture of the overall habitat. So this tells me it's on serpentine, um, so I know that that's the habitat. Um, recognizing the similarities to some of the plants that I've shown you today, and then Calflora and iNaturalist. iNaturalist in particular can give you um, artificial intelligence informed suggestions, or you can tag people who have, um, who have been identifying plants for a while. So um, looking at other photos of the plant, once it's given you that suggestion is really important. Uh, how to be a fire follower. So this is actually one of the ways that you can dig a little deeper is, um, as I'm sure all of you know, there was a really historically large fire season last year and fire for humans is uh, tremendously traumatic, but for plants, it can actually be a great thing. Um, a lot of the seed bank is just, and particularly some of the bulb plants are really just waiting for a fire to wake up. Um, and so we've started a community science program called um, How to Be a Fire Follower, CNPS Fire Followers. And you can uh, learn a little more information here at our website. So knowing before you go, some of the burn areas can be hazardous. So we have some links to uh, different places um, that we know are open and have been deemed safe to walk around, but really you wanna visit open sites safely um, and be ready for adventure and not only watch uh, where you're going from a human safety way, but also from a plant safety way. So we don't wanna be trampling these delicate plants when we're out there appreciating them. Taking a picture is really the way to go. Um, we don't want people collecting species because we want them to be able to live out their lives, particularly these annual plants. They're the only way that, that this seed bank gets replenished. And then you can share your observations on our iNaturalist project, and then we can help you actually get them identified, which is great. Um, another way, if you feel like you, you know a little bit about plants and you wanna dig a little deeper than that, we do have our rare plant treasure hunts where we revisit historic populations and map new ones and make that non-sensitive data available and then the submit the sensitive data to CNDDB. So there are a whole bunch of rare plants that haven't been seen in, in decades to hundreds of years. and this does actually mesh really well with the fire followers um, because you know it, the fire may be awakening old seed banks. So we talked about all of these things. I noticed a few questions about, um, about gardening. So calscape.org is our website for um, giving people information on what native plants might be suitable for their yard. So I also encourage you to visit that Thank you for putting that in the chat. Um, so this is me, my, e my email, awilliams at cnps.org. And then if you wanna find me on INAT, um, iNaturalist, I'm Boshniakia. So really appreciate your time today. I'm, I've come right up to the end, so I apologize for that, but I just, I can't stop talking about plants. So wonderful, Andrea. Thank you so much. You covered so much so quickly for everybody. Um, we all appreciate you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, and um, we know there's so many more questions. You did a wonderful job of answering questions along the way. So I think we're, we're good for today. Um, I did want to, again, share a couple of resources. Post has put together a wonderful, very concise wildflower guide with very nice images. And that's available for free on our website, openspacetrust.org slash wildflowers. You could download it. Please share it with others who might um, enjoy it. 
And um, we, we covered a lot of ground and there's a lot more we could share about each particular plant family or, or species. And I just wanna, again, plug the California Native Plant Society, cnps.org. You could find information about your local chapters. Um, I've been enjoying many great similar um, online presentations on more specific topics related to California native plants. So um, if you wanna delve deeper, please check them out and, um, and you know, get involved. So- Yeah, uh, but, sorry to interrupt, but the Santa Clara Valley chapter is, is really great as well as the East Bay chapter. So you're, you know, really, we're all really lucky in the Bay Area, the Marin chapter as well to have you know, these really powerhouse chapters and the Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz chapter as well. All really great, really active, um, putting on a lot of talks. Wonderful, great. Well, um, with that, we hope all of you are able to get out to some of your favorite locations and kind of start getting deeper into um, wildflower knowledge and appreciation. So um, I'm gonna say goodbye now, Andrea, and thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.